I should do what matters. Mute, ma'am.
Hello and good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. Just type in the chat box if you can hear me. Yay, I'm excited. So good morning, ladies, and maybe a few gentlemen here. I'm very excited to be here and um, introducing the program for today. My name is Dr. Ola Brown. I'm a medical physician. I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm also an investor. Um, and my background is in medicine. I um, graduated with a degree in medicine and surgery. I then went on to found um, West Africa's first air ambulance service. Shortly after that, um, I went into private investing, um, took my degree in finance and economics. And now I run a healthcare investment company, which is focused on healthcare infrastructure, um, which as you know, is very important um, for Nigeria and for Africa as a whole as well as investing um, in technology businesses and, and private equity businesses. So it, it's great to be here. Um, and welcome, welcome to the fifth Flourish Africa conference. Um, Flourish Africa is an organization that is focused on empowering women across the continent. And that's why I'm always excited when I get the invitation to be part of, um, be part of one of these conferences. Because African women are unique. Did you know that African women, as a percentage of the world's population, have the highest number of women or the highest percentage of women engaged in entrepreneurship. So about 40%, 30 to 40% of African women are engaged in some form of entrepreneurship or the other. That's in comparison to Europe and America, where lower percentages of women are engaged in entrepreneurship. Um, but sadly, even though more African women are engaged in entrepreneurship than anywhere else in the world, we're still the poorest. So African women actually make far less money on a per capita basis um, than anywhere else in the world as well. We also have the highest maternal mortality rate. So more women die in the process of pregnancy and childbirth than anywhere else in the world. So those things, those Things, having the highest number of women engaged in entrepreneurship, but still some, um, some of the poorest healthcare outcomes and the highest levels of poverty are some of the areas that Flourish Africa as an organization focused on women aims to change. And they work in the area of entrepreneurship, in the area of women's health, um, and in the area of poverty alleviation. So I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of this conference once again in being part of this story of empowerment um, for not just Nigerian women, but women across the continent. Today's conference will be focusing on mental health, um, which is an extremely divisive issue, but something that has become, in the past year with the COVID pandemic and with a few high-profile um, high celebrities also putting a spotlight on mental health, has become something that a lot of people are more comfortable talking about. And I'm glad that we're going to be addressing the issue today. But with no further ado, I would like to invite the convener of this conference um, to give her opening remarks. Um, and if you could give a warm online welcome, either in the comments, <laughs> um, to help me welcome in the comments by raising your hands or clapping your hands in the comments, for the convener of this conference, Apostle Foloran Shaw Alakija, to give her opening remarks. Our keynote speaker. Dr. Ogbonjubola Babalola Abiri. Our moderator, Dr. Ola Brown. Our distinguished guest speakers, all Flourish Africa participants. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebrisius, Director General of the World Health Organization said, and I quote, good mental health is absolutely fundamental to overall health and well-being. I welcome you warmly to the fifth edition of our annual Flourish Africa Conference 2021. The theme for this year's conference 
is mental health keeping stable in an unstable world we are holding the conference virtually like last year due to the continuous covid 19 pandemic restrictions on gatherings by the government the covid 19 pandemic is a major health crisis that has changed the lives of millions of people globally as of 14th September 2021, the World Health Organization records a total of over 225 million confirmed cases with over 4 million deaths globally. This has resulted in different countries introducing measures to restrict social interactions and movements of people to reduce the number of people infected with the disease. The effect is that people now have to adapt to changes in their daily routines, the new realities of working from home temporarily, unemployment, home schooling of children, and lack of physical contact with other family members, friends and colleagues have resulted in a negative effect on the physical and mental health of many people especially those with existing mental health conditions according to a world health organization survey of 10th october 2020 it reported that bereavement isolation loss of income and fear are triggering mental health conditions or exasperating existing ones. It further said that many people may be facing increased levels of alcohol and drug abuse, insomnia and anxiety. In addition, to this, COVID-19 itself can lead to neurological and mental complications such as delirium, agitation, and even stroke. As we return to a new normal lifestyle endangered by the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a need for us to look after our mental health and help others who may need some extra support and care. This is what informed our decision at Flourish Africa to bring together seasoned speakers who will provide us with the information on how to take care of our mental health. They are in the persons of Dr. Ola Brown, our moderator for today's conference. She is the founder of Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment Group and director of Green Tree Investment Company. The Flying Doctors Health Investment Company operates and invests in healthcare and wellness projects in Africa across the value chain. Second, Dr. Kafaya Balogunogunshola, popularly known as the emphatic doctor, is widely known as a mental health influencer and advocate who pioneered the use of Nigerian languages, Pidgin, Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa, as a mental health advocate tool, advocacy tool. She's a specialist physician, a consultant, neuropsychiatric logistics director for suicide research and prevention initiative in Nigeria. She runs Empathy Space NG. Their focus is raising awareness for and highlighting 
per pertinent issues relating to mental illness. Their goal is to destigmatize emotional illness in Nigeria. The third person, Dr. Bojubola Babalola Abiri, is a consultant psychiatrist, managerial psychologist, and the medical director of Tranquil and Quest Behavioral Health. She co-authored the book titled Mental Health in the Workplace. She's a mental health, sexual, and gender-based violence advocate who is driven by the holistic view to health and is a regular voice on various print and electronic media where she utilizes various illustrations and indigenous languages to reach her audience. She currently volunteers with the Lagos State COVID-19 Psychosocial Response Team to contribute a quota to fighting against the pandemic. Four, Ms. Hawa Ojiafo. She's the founder of the She Writes Woman, a woman-led movement giving mental health a voice in Nigeria. A multiple award winner, she became the first Nigerian woman to receive the Queen's Young Leaders Award in 2018 at age 26 in recognition of her work to overcome the stigma around mental health. In 2020, she was awarded the Change Maker Award by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for her work in promoting gender equality. Also in February 2020, Hawa, in conjunction with the Human Rights Watch, became the first woman to testify before the Nigerian Parliament on the rights of persons with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities in the country. A sexual and domestic violence survivor herself, her platform provides support through a helpline teletherapy and virtual support to survivors of gender-based violence and those living with mental health conditions are provided with psychosocial support and counseling. Let me share with you a brief history about Flourish Africa. The Flourish Africa project was born out of the desire to create a global community of like-minded individuals that encourages and helps women thrive in all aspects of their lives. We believe that by sharing experiences, ideas, thoughts, and information, we would build a group of formidable women who not only want to make a difference, but want to be the difference in their spheres of influence by doing things differently. Our online platform can be assessed on our website, www.flourishafrica.com. We are currently in the process of commencing training for 2,500 female entrepreneurs, out of which 1 billion Naira, approximately 2.4, million dollars in grants will be given to 500 female business owners over the next five years once again i welcome you all to the 2021 flourish africa conference 
please make sure that you listen attentively to this amazing power-packed conference. We will flourish. God bless you. Thank you, Ma, for the inspiring and motivating opening remarks um, and highlighting some of the achievements of the excellent and experienced women that we have speaking at this conference today. Um, and following those remarks, I'd like to introduce the first of those women um, to give an opening presentation right before the keynote. Her name is Dr. Kafaya Ogunshola. MBBS, FWACP. She's a consultant psychiatrist and also the MD CEO of Empathy Spaces. I think one of the biggest achievements for, um, for me reading her profile is the fact that she's managed to bridge the language barrier in, men um, in mental health for mental health services by pioneering the use of our traditional languages um, like Hausa, Ibo, Yoruba, and Pidgin in mental health. And I'm sure she'll be speaking a bit more about um, how she managed to do that, as well as the other elements of her work in her opening remarks. It's been great to um, connect with you, Dr. Kabaya. It's been great to read about you. And congratulations on all the work that you've done. And I'm very excited and will be listening attentively um, to what you have to say. Thank you very much. I think you're still on mute, doctor. Yep, I was just trying to get my slides um, set up. Perfect, we yep. can see them. Great. Just in Thank March. you. I will do that shortly. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining in on the conference and for listening to me speak this morning. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to go on. Um, I'm aware that I have um, 30 minutes, which means I have to manage time. There is so much to talk about in this presentation of mine, and I truly hope that I'm going to be able to get through it right. So this is what we're doing today. This is my, my discourse navigation. So warm greetings, warm, pleasant, fantastic greetings to everyone joining me from everywhere today. I saw... Sokoto, I saw Mexico. So welcome, guys. Welcome from every part of Nigeria as well. Um, this is a short task that I would also be doing today. I like to talk about mental health checks, something everyone should be familiar about, you know, and from time to time, something you should be able to do for yourself by yourself, we don't, you know, without anyone, um, you know, assisting. How am I feeling? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? And what can I do to feel better? Or what is my immediate need? If everyone, if you're able to master this, you know, you learn the art of self-soothing. And that's a problem with a lot of people. They are unable to soothe themselves and then things begin to escalate, you know, and, um, you know, um, get to the point where, uh, I mean, you know, things deteriorate further. So I want everyone to note this down. And you can look at my, you can look at some resources on my page where you can actually find how it's broken down, how, how you can use this for yourself. And then we would go to the, the proper, um, you know, um, dis, um, discussion today has to do with self-compassion. And why do I think that we need to, you know, to, to do, to, to know this or to be aware of this? Dr. Ola, when she introduced, had mentioned how much um, women do so much in Nigeria, how much of entrepreneurs we are. And how, and yet we're still the ones who bear the brunt of, you know, the poor health indexes that's indices that are, you know, that abound in Nigeria. And that's why, you know, as you continue to strive and to try to position yourself and to partner yourself and to present yourself until your big break comes, you need to realize that um, there are certain things that you must show to yourself as you go. You have to learn the approach of self-compassion, which I find is very lacking in many of us. Now let's look at what are the things and how do we get to the point of, you know, um, compassion. Now, um, we all have personal weaknesses, right? And the behaviors that would, 
reflect how you treat yourself in that situation would you know speak to whether you're being hostile to yourself or whether you're being kind to yourself you know so it, de it determines the kind of relationship you have with yourself so yes everyone has a relationship with themselves so the first um, behavior that you can have to yourself where you're very hostile to yourself and neglecting of your needs is termed self-neglect and it is characterized by criticism and judgment which a lot of us do i used to do it you know but i'm working on myself and the latter refers to where you then pay attention to your need and if you notice if you check if you remember the last slide where i had said what is my immediate need? If you're able to identify your immediate need, it then means that a relationship you're having with yourself is that of compassion. How do you re how do you react when you're confronted with a personal weakness? I have a story of my own self in the past, but I know what the present me is. The present the, the present me is more compassionate, is more listening, is more attentive to my needs. The past me would criticize every mistake that I did and would not even pay attention to anything that I did positively. So this is just an explanation of what I've been talking about. We're gonna watch this video shortly. Um, this video, um, I have to. I hope that everyone can hear it. No one even likes you. You're worthless. Stop. I exist. I am real. I am enough. Now, um, did, can somebody just respond in the chat if they had the video play? I need to be sure that because I mean I'm I'm sharing screen. So, did you did did we get the video? Okay. I think that somebody's responding. Great. So some people heard it. Um, right. Great. Thank you. So did you see how we were referred to as acts in that video? Meaning that we should be valued. We should be taken care of. You are art. And when art becomes underappreciated, it becomes, it, it depreciates. And at the end, it tells you that you need to stop criticizing yourself and to remember that you are enough, you are important, and that you matter. Many women have not reconnected or have not connected with this important um, fact. Uh, I think on social media this morning, I heard about someone's burial, how everyone had come to talk about how fantastic she was. And in, um, in that video, nobody had said anything that she had done for herself or what she had been able to achieve because she constantly gave and gave and gave and gave and gave to everybody, you know, pushing herself to do more. And that at the eulogy read at her burial, nobody could actually say this is the life that she lived because everybody mentioned what she lived for other people, but not for what she lived for herself. Now, so these are the ways that, you know, so self-criticism is one of the ways that we manifest self-neglect. It's a punitive attitude to the self. So it's, you want to punish yourself for something that you think you have done. And this punishment could be for something that is real or actually perceived inadequacies. You can look at yourself and say you're not doing enough and then you begin to play and to, you know, to beat yourself for that and to blame yourself for not being able to do more. And it's important that we know that people who do this to themselves, that they, um, they score very, I mean, people who score highly on this experience hurtful and self-defeating thoughts when they are confronted with personal weakness. And personal weakness can be anything, you know, it could range from you having, um, you thinking that you, um, the way you speak is not good enough, or you think that the effort you put in a particular um, thing was not enough, or that you're not good enough a mother, you know, and it might just be that, like I mentioned, it could be perceived, it could be a good mother, but you're so fixated on the notion that you're not good enough and you continue to, you know, judge yourself. 
Okay, great. So these are the different ways, right, that self-criticism can affect us, okay? Um, they blame the self for being weak and not meeting a desired self-image. And yes, a lot of people put themselves on a particular pedestal. The image that you're in or the way your art is not the one you desire. So you continue to, you know, um, continue to tweak and to say you're not enough, you need to do more, right? And studies show that these individuals that, con that engage in constant and harsh scrutiny, they have a chronic fear of being disapproved and criticized. So you're not only doing it to yourself, you also think other people are doing it to yourself. And that's the double whammy, right? It means that the world is hitting at you and you're hitting at yourself again. And this state is associated with recovery from difficulty or periods of difficulty, like the pandemic. You know, people need to go, you know, to take a, a break and realize that the pandemic was tough on a lot of people. It wasn't just you that your business was affected. It wasn't just you that it strained your social relationships. It wasn't only you that got frustrated with your kids because it seemed like there were too much during that time. And then when people go through other, psych other you know, psychosocial um, struggles, like having a, um, problems in their marriages or their relationship or loss of, of um, a loved one, if you criticize yourself and take responsibility for things that are beyond yours, you will be practicing self-criticism. Now, another thing to look at is the inner critic, okay? And we all have the inner critic. The inner critic is that voice that we always hear. And it is the one that, it is, that you say it to yourself. It's not like an external voice, you know? So it's the inner voice and represents critical thinking. But unfortunately, Many of the times, the inner critic will deliver its message in a negative way, in a punitive way, okay? So its feedback is frequently harsh and unsupportive, and it can lead to negative emotions like guilt, shame, and anger, right? So you can say things like, if you don't work hard enough, you're gonna lose your job. If you don't put um, more, more time or more hours into your business, you're going to go bankrupt, you know? It will majorly monitor your weaknesses and mistakes. You messed up again. Is it only you? You know? And then it can use words like and command and say things like, you should stop acting the fool. And then he judges you, you're weak, you're not enough. Okay? So these are things that we need to be aware of. A lot of people don't know that other people have inner critics. They have only been able to tame it. It's not for lack of not having it, but they have been able to tame it. I always say to, I always say to my clients or to people who I speak to, the inner critic is good, but when it says, when it talks to you, sit down, do not internalize the negative aspect of the message that is delivered. You try to. How would you feel get... if someone were criticizing your every Okay, so moment, let's watch this video. Saying things like, you're so stupid. You're weird. You're not like other people. You're ugly. Look at your big nose. You probably wouldn't stand for it. You definitely wouldn't let anyone talk to a friend like that. So why do you tolerate this level of cruelty when you are criticizing yourself? We all have a critical inner voice instructing us on how to live our lives and influencing how we feel about ourselves and how we behave, like a nasty coach that lives inside our heads. The critical inner voice describes the part of us that is turned against ourselves. It consists of negative thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes that oppose our best interests and diminish our self-esteem. It's our own worst enemy. The critical inner voice strongly encourages self-defeating and self-destructive behavior with thoughts like, there's no point in trying, or why don't you just give up? And this hostile, judgmental advisor doesn't stop with us. It warns us about other people promoting angry and cynical attitudes toward them, and creating a negative, pessimistic picture of the world. The inner voice can also be deceptively self-soothing. It may sound sweet and supportive while encouraging us to act in ways that are self-destructive. For instance, the voice may say, Have another glass of wine. You've had a rough day. You deserve it. But after you've had that second glass of wine, the voice may change its tune and punish you for the very behavior it just encouraged firing off comments like, what are you, an alcoholic? Don't you have any self-control? 
The critical inner voice exists to varying degrees in every person. Although most of us are conscious of some aspects of this inner critic, many of our negative thoughts exist on an unconscious level. Too often we just accept these vicious tirades as the truth. So where does the critical inner voice come from? The way we are viewed growing up and the attitudes directed toward us as children shape how we see ourselves. Harmful views directed at us by parents or other influential caretakers are internalized to make up our self-image. Children also pick up on the critical feelings their parents have toward themselves, and they may take on a parent's self-attacks as their own. Kids are particularly sensitive to times where a parent overreacts critically toward them, like when a parent loses it during times of stress. It's not just our parents' attitudes toward us that gives substance to the critical inner voice. Other influential adults, such as significant family members or teachers, can impact the way we see ourselves. So can siblings, peers, and even society at large. As we get older, we carry these critical thoughts with us. Only now, we think these negative things about ourselves. If we pay attention, we can observe the critical inner voice at work in various areas of our lives. Its nasty assaults diminish our self-esteem, interfere with our romantic relationships, undermine us at work, and intrude on our parenting. Great. So um, that video explains what I've been trying to say. So I'm just going to run on because I need to talk more about um, self-compassion. So what are the different things that can, how the inner critic can think you can you know you practice a lot of self blame, self judgment, self loathing. It, it turns and mocks you know, it questions your ability and your adequacy, and then you're likely to personalize personalize a lot of things in the way it will speak to you. Okay, and then you think extremely or catastroph in a catastrophic way about things that happen to you. You know there are no gray areas or there are no oh you know um you know this is oh, this happened but I can come back from it. it's like oh this is the end of everything all right so I always say to my clients like I said um when you have when you have that when you have the inner critic that is very loud listen to the message but try and reframe what it's trying to tell you what are the lessons in what your inner critic voice or what the you know the what the critic is telling you so it could say things like you can call you names fool weak unattractive i had a client once who said to me that you know um they would refer to themselves as stupid you know and then she further went on to say that you know she and um, she did not she would if sometimes it feels like she should crawl out of her skin and add on another skin. Those are some of the ways that when you when you criticize when you criticize yourself harshly and judge yourself harshly, those are the kind of thoughts that you'll be having with yourself. It can compare you to the to other people. It's called upward comparison. It won't compare you to your peers who that you're on the same level. You started out at the same time, and you probably can break even at the same time. You probably will be comparing you with people like um, opposed to following Shak Alakija, someone that has put in the work for how many years? You're not even on the same, you're not the same age. That's what the inner critic also does. So upward comparison, not peer comparison, or even the comp or people below, you know, below you or behind you. And then you can set very high standards, you know, or impossible standards of perfection, you know, like telling you that by the end of this year, you should have about 50 million in your account in the pandemic world. You know, those are the kind of things that the inner critic does. And, if, and we need to be aware. So ladies, women, you know, gents, if you are in the, you need to be aware that that's the, the inner critic, and you know you need to um, manage it, right? It pays little to your to your attention. It pays little or no attention to your accomplishments. All the things that you have done right, the inner critic does not see it. It will belittle that. It will magnify all your failures and your weaknesses. It will never remind you of the things that you have been able to do, despite being a mother of maybe four or five kids, you know, running a side business, um, tending to the needs of a thousand and one people. So you must be alert. Now, um, so once, once all of that is going on, definitely know that you're practicing self-neglect, okay? And it is, um, although it is directed at correcting a weakness that I, like I mentioned, you know, which might even be perceived, it might not even be real, you know? 
It doesn't pay attention to self-care, which is what every woman should know going forward. Self-care is important. Self-care is not expensive. Self-care can just be compassion for yourself whilst you're going through a difficult time. So let's look at what are the things that comprises self-care, right? And self-compassion. It means treating yourself with care and concern when considering personal inadequacies, right? And mistakes and failures and painful life situations. And it has all these interacting components, kindness to yourself, a sense of humanity, a sense of I am not alone versus a sense of why me, you know, why is this happening to just me? And then mindfulness over I over identification. I'm going to try and explain this in follow, um, in other slides. Now, evidence shows that if you're able to do all of this, you know, soothe yourself, provide self-compassion for yourself, that it provides, it promotes mental well-being, physical well-being, social well-being, and resilience. All right. So what, are, what, are, what do I mean by self-kindness and compassion? It's the tendency to be caring and understanding with yourself as opposed to be critical. So rather than attacking yourself and berating yourself for personal shortcomings, you choose warmth and uncondition, unconditional acceptance, right? Now, this is where it gets tricky because my clients will then say, oh, you always talk about self-compassion, uh, self-kindness. Um, How am I knowing that I'm not being too light on myself? So this is not complacency. So I'm not speaking to the people who sit in their houses every day and expect you know, money to turn up in their account. I'm talking about people who leave the house and really put in the work, the hours, you know, they, they're consistent, they, they, they show up, you know, there is, they do everything they need to do and at the end of the day, they still fall short. So this is not excuse of, for self-responsibility or the things you need to do. Because whilst you're being kind to yourself, like I mentioned, when the critical voice is loud in your head, look at the behaviors that the critical voice is actually attacking and then refresh it in a better way for yourself. And, you know, and then, so that you can begin to manage or change or work towards changing these unproductive um, behaviors that is actually making that thing to happen, right? And um, when life circumstances are stressful, instead of trying to fix the problem, sometimes it's okay to step, to step back and say that, what do I need now? Like after this seminar, I could feel like I'm tired, you know, or maybe something didn't go well with the webinar. Rather than jump onto the next thing, I can say to myself, what do you think that you need? And the need might just be maybe a few hours of just sitting down, you know, you know, and trying to praise myself for what has happened. So for whatever thing you find yourself, instead of trying to fix the problem immediately, try and say, what is the immediate need? The need might just be, you know, a nap. It can be like a very difficult day. You're having headache. What will make that headache go away? Maybe just a nap, all right? Now, what do I mean by sense of common humanity? It involves recognizing that you and I, that we're imperfect and we all go through periods of difficulties. People just know how to mask their own differently or people might just have better support and are able to handle theirs you know, quickly, not that they don't go through their own problems. Um, so on the time, I, th I thought I had 30, but I'm hearing I have five more minutes. So I'm going to have to breeze through to the things that I think are important. Right, okay, so I think what, what I'm actually, so yes, so the ability to cultivate this sense of common humanity, you know, like, oh, I'm not alone in this. For example, what, what is going on right now in the Nigerian situation? It is, it's generalized to all of us, but some people are, you know, over identifying with it. They're taking it on as if it's their own personal problem. It's all of us problem. And whilst we're trying to, to deal with it and to manage it, we all need to, you know, just take it easy on ourselves and not personalize it. You know, your business is not, um, not going the way you want it to go because of the, you know, the economic climb. It's not because you're not doing well or good enough. Now, the other thing we need to do is mindfulness, which is ability to be aware of your experiences in a way that neither denies the problem. So you're not saying you don't have that problem, but you're also not exaggerating it like, oh, this is the end of it. Like, I can't come back from this. You know, this, and if you examine yourself very well, you would know really that this is some things that we all do. You know, um, like I mentioned, anyone who is trying to be honest will tell you that, you know, they're also working on it. And the best of us, even though we've been in the field of mental health, 
before. It's not like we, we learned all these things. These are things that we've had to learn on the job for us to be able to help our clients and you know also learn from our clients. So these are some of the thoughts that arise from a self-compassionate attitude. I'm trying my best. I'm human, just like other people. Um, I never signed a contract to be perfect. That's very important. A lot of people think that they have to deliver on a level or they have to show perfection. Perfection, I don't know if it's something that is attainable. You know, we can strive for it, but I don't think it's attainable. Next time, I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning from this. Next time, I'll do differently, okay? And those are the things that would um, connote that. Okay, so this is um, a flow chart that talks about, um, you know, self-compassion. But what I'm going to say is, some of these things are materials that you can also find online and so that you can you know, read further about it. Now, self-care means tuning into and towards one's suffering, tuning into like trying to get in touch with what is going on with you, monitoring your feelings and carefully considering what is needed at the very most, the next moment. Self-care means what do I need? What is important to me, even as a mother, you know, sometimes you're with your five children, the whole place is scattered, you're so tired, but because of your strive, because you want to be perfect or you want your home to look perfect, rather than just go and take a minute, there's also nanny in the house so that can help you to maybe watch the kids for like 30 minutes for you to go and sleep. You would decide in that minute that that's the minute you want to start shouting, that the nanny should put the house in order, you know, instead of you to just go in, take a nap, and that's the minute you're also trying to carry the children, those are the things I'm talking about. What is your immediate need? Learn to know what your need is so that you can go towards it. And self-neglect is when your, com your behavior completely abandons, you, abandons your needs, you know, and then you go on to inflict emotional pain to yourself via critical thinking and upward comparison that I mentioned before. In very extreme cases, self-neglect can lead to physical harm. People cut themselves, you know, because they don't pay attention to their need. They hate themselves. They're judging themselves. They, and they want to, you know, feel some form of relief, they start cutting themselves. Some people hit themselves. Some people, you know, take on a lot of reckless and life-threatening behaviors, okay? Drugs, sex, escapades. Some people will say because they're trying to feel better, you know, they go on, on, you know, sex urges and all of those things. It shows that you're neglecting what your immediate need is and just, you know, um, practicing self-neglect. And, of course, um, if you don't take care of yourself, who will? I mean, that's a very important question. And that's because a lot of people then tend to move out for external care. They don't know that the most important care is the one that you give to yourself. Self-care can be sitting down, putting your leg on the stool. I'm rounding up. I think this is my last slide. Yes, great. So I'm on the last slide. Um, so self-care is um, putting your leg on the stool sometimes, taking a nap, you know, going for a, a spa date, um, or just taking green tea in your house. It doesn't have to be planning a vacation to, to the Maldives or the Seychelles. Not everyone can afford that. So self-care that you're able to do in your house, or self-care can even just be a day of, oh, I won't go to the office today, you know, I'm just going to um, take care of myself. So self-care isn't always expensive. It can be you just choosing yourself and prioritizing yourself from all that is happening around us. That's my... Um, that's my time. Thank you. Cause I'm, I try to keep to time. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Wow. Dr. <laughs> Gunshola, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure the audience learned a lot. Um, I definitely learned a lot. And before I introduce the keynote speaker, um, I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the points that I think are most pertinent and some of the points that I feel like our um, participants should really take away in terms of what you said. Um, I think mental health has been in the spotlight and that's why people um, sort of are, are more accepting about talking about mental health. Um, and uh, Dr. Ogoshola, as you might recall, earlier in the year, we had two prominent black women um, who are athletes, who are sports people, have to take some time out. Um, Simone Biles, who's a famous athlete, had to stop in the middle of the Tokyo Olympics and say, look, I've had enough. And you said something, you said that, you know, Nigeria, especially African women, we have a tendency of, oh, you know, we always have to be active, we always have to be doing something, even with our five kids, even though the nana is there, we still feel like we need to be you know, and if somebody as famous and prominent as that in the middle of Olympics could say, look, 
I'm not ready anymore, I need to take some time out, um, then I think that that teaches us a lot um, about who we should be choosing. Naomi Osaka as well, in the middle of um, a very important tennis tournament, actually said stop. And, um, you know, a lot of people criticized her for that. And one of the questions I asked on my social media is, what if she had had a heart attack? Would you have told her that she should continue playing? So what's the difference between a heart attack and a mental health attack? Um, and she actually got more endorsements because companies that realized how important mental health is actually gave her money, contributed money um, for, she was supposed to pay a penalty. They contributed money to pay her penalty. She got endorsed by, she, so she made more money because people could relate to that. They were all called, at one point, they were called lazy, they were called weak, they were called attention seeking. They were saying it was something that only happens to people that don't believe in God. A lot of Nigerians on social media were saying it was a lack of faith. But actually, if you, um, I'm, I'm a Christian, so um, I can speak to the Bible. If you look at people like David and Jonah and Naomi, and um, I put a picture of a fish here because of Jonah. Um, they all experienced what we would now refer to as mental health issues. They all expressed feelings of depression. And even Jesus Christ himself, he cried. So is crying, um, I, I think we need to move away from this um, perception of showing emotion or feeling down as weakness. Um, we've all been brought up, like you said, to be that superwoman, doing everything, staying fashionable, working in church, looking after in-laws, looking after parents, working on the business. And we've always been told and brought up, is this how you're going to behave in your husband's house? I can remember when I bought my first um, Range Rover, they're like, ah, no man will marry you with this kind of car. But at the same time, they'll tell you that no man wants to marry a liability. So you're supposed to be all things to all people, doing everything for everybody else, but not really choosing yourself. And I think that that was the point that you ended on that was very important. Simone Biles, the gymnast, was recently covered um, in the New Yorker magazine. And um, one of the things, one of the key headlines um, in that article was about choosing yourself. Um, and um, as you can read there, it said uh, Simone Biles chose herself. Um, so my main takeaway and one of the major points that sort of I've um, put in my mind from your talk is about not feeling bad for occasionally choosing yourself, despite everything about our upbringing saying that we should never choose ourselves as women. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, again, a consultant psychiatrist, a managerial psychologist, a professional speaker, a lecturer, and medical director of um, Tranquil and Quest Behavioral Health, Lagos. Um, she's a fellow of the West African College of Physicians, a member of the Nigerian Medical Association, a member of the Employee Assistance Professional Association, a member of the uh, American Psychiatric Association. She's received trainings from King's College London, the University of Washington, and the prestigious Harvard University, Boston. She is passionate about research in child and adolescent forensic and women's mental health, as well as occupational health. And she uses her knowledge in psychiatry and psychology to influence and maximize the effectiveness and productivity in the workplace through her work with the employee assistance um, program. She has a video that she'd like to share with us um, as part of her keynote, after which we'll be um, summarizing it and taking questions and answers. I'd like to introduce now um, Dr. I'd like to start today's speech by welcoming everyone to a beautiful and indeed glorious morning. Welcome women to the 2021 Flourish Africa Conference. I am indeed filled with great joy and pleasure and so much honor in my heart to be given this rare privilege to deliver the keynote speech for the Flourish Africa Conference 2021. I do not take this privilege for granted at all and will as such at this point in time use this opportunity to congratulate and thank Apostle Folon Oshua Lakija, the founder 
of Flourish Africa and the entire team who have worked tirelessly and assiduously in ensuring that this conference is indeed a success. To my other speakers, moderators and panelists, I say well done. And of course, I thank all of you women, yes you, for making this event come to fruition. We have waited for you and I'm indeed glad that you are here. The theme for this year's conference, mental health, keeping stable in an unstable world, is indeed apt and timely. I must of course add that it is extremely commendable that the team at Flourish Africa decided to shine the spotlight on such a sensitive and topical issue, which is given less than the attention that it truly and honestly deserves. I am indeed, of course, excited to be speaking about mental health, an issue that has over the years been given a backseat, shrouded in secrecy, spoken about in harsh tones, regarded with stigma, discrimination, with misconceptions continually foiled by ignorance. These factors, coupled with religious and cultural undertones in a society like ours, have allowed most people to continue to pretend like ostrich with head in sand about an issue that affects and of course concerns us all. The past 18 months thereabout of our lives have indeed been impacted by the traumatic life event of the COVID-19 pandemic. Traumatic because it was sudden, unexpected, overwhelming us, our resources and our, indeed our abilities to cope with the resultant effects. Our lives and our world as we previously once knew them have indeed undergone massive changes. Still, we pressed on. Interestingly, the COVID-19 pandemic and mental health have characteristics common to them both, as they both have been described as the unseen, silent enemy. They are both no respect of persons, regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic status, race, and religion. They have also both been described as levelers. The impact of mental health on all of us is far-reaching. Mental health describes an individual's ability to successfully perform the functions of the mind, which include cognition, thought, beliefs, perception, emotion, and other aspects of behavior. Being mentally healthy ensures that every individual is able to cope with the normal stresses of life, have thriving relationships, contribute his or our own quota to the environment that they live in, and of course remain productive. We all have mental health. What we all do not, however, have is mental illness. Mental illness, on the other hand, describes abnormalities in functioning of the mind, with the burden of mental illnesses described by WHO as being enormous. The WHO has, of course, said, the World Health Organization, that is, that one in four persons at some point in their lives will come down with a mental health disorder. Mental illnesses add to disease morbidity, mortality, increased suffering, disability, cause an important loss of freedom and may sometimes result in death. As women, 21st century women to be precise, we are often described as women in the middle as we are saddled with responsibilities, challenges, obstacles and stressors, some of which may be self-induced while others are family, work and an environmental induced. As women, unique and beautiful as we are, we are more at risk of mental health disorders compared with men because of our biological makeup, our genes, our hormones, the traumatic and adverse life events that we are exposed to, as well as the roles and expectations that society has thrust upon us. Women have indeed been at risk for various mental disorders such as anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, personality disorders, body image issues, self-image, self-esteem issues, eating disorders, sexual disorders, sleep disorders, substance use disorders, pregnancy related issues, postpartum related issues, and of course issues of childbearing and rearing. It may interest you to know that women are two times more likely to attempt suicide, develop depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder when compared with men. In addition, women are also three times more likely 
to develop eating disorders when compared with men. Society often describes women as frail, weaker vessels, unable at times to shoulder too much responsibility. We have been observed and described by society as caring for everyone but ourselves, leaving ourselves behind and our self-care at the detriment of our own health, with some women sometimes glorying in their own suffering and the distress that they go through. As women, we work hard. We are daughters, sisters, wives, carers, women, homemakers, nurturers, and much more. The 21st century world has been described as a VUCA world, a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, risk-filled world with women experiencing challenges and obstacles in their personal lives, family lives, careers, and indeed in their societies. The fast pace, innovation, creativity, information overload, more virtual interactions, yet little or no physical or social intimacy are also major issues of stress for women. It can be tough, it can be challenging, it can be tedious to be a woman. And being a woman in these recent times, of course, comes with its own attendant challenges of catering to self, to family, reaching potentials at the workplace, including breaking and shattering the glass ceiling. The current challenges of insecurity, financial challenges, dominantly patriarchal societies, religious biases, cultural norms have continued to plague women from Nigeria to Somalia to even very recently Afghanistan. Wanda K. Jones states that women's mental health is critical to their overall health and to the health of the nation. A healthy woman is definitely a panacea and as such, in a chaotic, challenging, and often volatile world, as women, we need to make our mental health a priority. Let's start by learning what I would call the four L's. And the first L is that we should learn first about yourself, about others, family, friends, loved ones, and then of course learn about mental health and mental illnesses. We must continually work hard at developing, empowering, and educating ourselves as women. The second L is that we must learn to listen to each other. Listen. Listen twice as much as you speak. Listen in a kind, compassionate, and non-judgmental manner. Listen to other people to hear what it is that they're saying whenever they go through a rough patch. The third L that I would encourage you to do is to look out. Look out for yourself and look out for each other. Recognize warning signs which are often overlooked because we don't know what these warning signs are. And these warning signs may be changes in our behavior, in our sleeping patterns, eating patterns, sexual patterns, or how it is that we even relate and respond to individuals. We should learn to link people with sources of support where they can get help support which may be financial, may be spiritual. Women, of course, need support and it may, of course, be health support as well. As women, to remain stable in an unstable world and to ensure that we remain in mental health, we need to do the following. We must remember that other women like us are broken record shattered glass ceilings, made history, and that we and them are one and the same. We should tend to ourselves first, putting on our mask first before helping others. We should understand our bodies and ensure that we care for ourselves. We must avoid serving from an empty vessel. We must identify people, places, and processes that are detrimental to our health, both physical and mental health. We must love ourselves, enjoy our own company, and of course, affirm ourselves at all times. We must indeed be our own biggest cheerleaders as we understand our thoughts, 
the impact on our feelings and of course on our behavior. We must learn to create time for ourselves, create time for rest and sleep, resist isolation and be intentional, deliberate and conscious with our relationships. We must manage our physical, mental, emotional and spiritual energies well. We should learn to forgive ourselves when things go wrong. And we should avoid abuse, not even from ourselves. We must find support groups that tend to us and that can nourish us as well. We must practice gratitude, learning to see the best in every situation and being thankful for our experiences. We must reach out, seek help and get help, especially as concerns our mental health. We must continually remind ourselves that healthy women are a panacea. They are problem solvers, especially when in the best frame of mind, when mentally healthy. When a woman is well, her home is well, her work is well, and indeed, the nation is well. We must remember that as always, mental health is wealth, and that there is indeed no health and no justice without mental health. I'd like to thank you once again, dear women, for this great opportunity to deliver this keynote speech at this year's Flourish Africa 2021 conference. It is my hope and desire that above all things, you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. I encourage you to continually flourish at all times. I remain Bonjibola Abiri, and I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity and for listening. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aviri. Um, again, a fascinating presentation where you introduced um, some areas that we hadn't quite spoken about before. So the importance of um, resisting isolation, you know, the importance of support groups, the role of abuse, and the fact that we can even be abusive to ourselves and the importance of rest and sleep. Um, thank you for a great presentation and um, I'm looking forward to you joining us at the Q&A session. The final presentation will be given by somebody that I've always admired. Um, I'm a big fan of her work on Twitter as well as her advocacy um, work for mental health. Um, we spoke for the first time a few days ago when we we're doing the trial run for this, um, for the, for this event. So I'm very excited um, to have her here. Um, and well, she'll be telling us um, some, a personal story um, of how she came to found her organization and the impacts that she's had, including a few firsts um, for a Nigerian woman um, in terms of her achievements. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Hawa Ojefo. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Um, to give us her, um, her talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Ola. Um, good morning, every single person. Thank you all for joining. Wow, the number of attendees has grown since I looked at the panel last. Thank you so much to my other speakers, Dr. Bonjubola Abiri, uh, people that have been very so Dr. Ola for moderating this, and hopefully we get to review the relationship over the coming days. Um, first off, I would like to thank Apostle Folonsho Alakija for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much for the work you do with Flourish Africa, for having um, me here uh, as a person who is going to bring uh, lived experience. And I particularly thank you because a lot of times when mental health conversations are had in, in this country, in Nigeria, a lot of times what happens is that uh, we tend to forget the voices of people who actually have lived experience. And so um, I find it really, um, I'm pretty grateful for the opportunity to really share from, from that perspective here today. I must commend all the attendees of um, this amazing conference. Um, Flourish Africa, thank you so much for the work you've been doing. I enjoyed every aspect of Dr. Bonjou's uh, keynotes and Dr. Kafaya's presentation. 
there's so much of them, so much value in what they gave us today. So as much as possible, what I would try to do is not to overemphasize some of the things that have already been said and move on to things that I believe that perhaps we haven't particularly had the chance to um, internalize. So I always like to talk first from a place of personal experience, like I said, and I will start with my lived experience. And from there, I would go into, um, when I share a couple of things, I will share learnings and opportunities. I will share challenges. And then I would also then narrow it down to the events of the last 18 months, the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has affected us, but also for people who have had pre-existing mental health conditions and people who haven't as well. Um, I believe that there is a lot of value in you know, this conversation. And from there, we'll begin to draw certain nuggets on how to keep stable in an unstable world. When I talk about my lived experience, I like to generally talk about it from three um, sort of like phases and sections of my life. The first being a pre-diagnosis um, section, the second being a diagnosis part, and the third being a post-diagnosis part. So on the one hand, you know, it's going through your life, not knowing, you know, feeling like you're dealing with everyday stressors and then realizing that perhaps, you know, there is something there. I, the one event that had to stop me completely and, you know, in my, in my tracks in life and to help me go back to my entire journey is when I had a near suicide attempt in February of 2016. And I, I could have never thought it was going to be me because every time we talk about suicide, it's always just like, oh, it's those people, um, not me, you know. We never really think about it from a personal perspective. We don't think it's, oh, no, my life is going fine. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's not that bad. And I could have sworn that that was the case with me as well, you know, even the day before where I was laughing and chatting with family and friends. And on that day that it happened, I realized for the first time how much of everything that had been stored inside me wanted to come out. But here's the thing, about five months before that, I had started um, trying to receive mental health care. And I, I highlight this because this is very easily, even though that was 2015, this is very easily the reality of a lot of people, a lot of women today, is that we're going through things and we're looking for care and support. And so we cannot particularly find it. And, and, and that's what was going on with me at that time. I wasn't particularly sure where to go to, who to trust, who to talk to. Um, and so I started doing the journey alone. I found somebody on social media who referred me to somebody at the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Yaba. I went there, I started during the process, I went broke. I, I knew that it was important for me to put my money to it, to invest in it, to, you know, um, do what was necessary for me to save myself and for me to somewhat stay sane and protect my mental health. But there was a lot more that needed to be done. and I didn't just have the finances. So when I think about the challenges um, with regards to seeking any form of mental health support, there's the reality of the fact that we have such a fragmented healthcare system in Nigeria in such a way that people do not particularly know where to go to when things like this are. Ideally, we would have it at the primary healthcare level, but we don't particularly have that um, in Nigeria, where at the primary healthcare level, everyday people can walk into places to see uh, somebody with regards, you know, psychosocial support. And so that is one thing that I want to highlight. And even though I don't classify myself as the average Nigerian, from being very honest, I would say I belong to perhaps the upper middle class. I still had to go through that challenge. I still could not tell family yet at that time, um, this was five months prior to my near suicide attempt. Um, I couldn't tell family, I had to do it by myself. I had to, I still went broke. I still, you know, I was, do, I was going it by myself, trying to wing it. And a lot of us are doing that. So that's an opportunity that I wanna highlight. The fact that we are doing things by ourselves because we don't know that there is any other way to actually do it. We don't know that perhaps there are groups or organizations or support systems out there that you can very easily connect with from wherever you are. We certainly have those in Atchi Rights Woman where you can get the support so that you don't have to go at it alone. So I started seeing the psychologist. I got diagnosed with bipolar and post-traumatic stress disorder. I have spoken several times openly about my multiple sexual violence experiences. 
And I've also spoken about the shame and the fear of not being able to disclose it to loved ones because of, you know, how much shame and um, all of the kinds of questions that tend to come with it. I was already dealing with a lot of self-blame and self-hate all by myself. So I didn't need anybody to reinforce or rub it in for me. And so I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my sister whom I shared in bed with um, all that time. Um, and so I continued to do life. When I went broke, I had the idea that, oh, no, no worries. I've had a couple of therapy sessions. I think I get what this is all about. I think I now understand this whole mental health thing. Oh, I should track my moods. Okay, my thoughts. Okay, I should, I should track my, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I, I got this. I got this. And so I continued with uh, feeling a little bit better. I continued my life. But I didn't realize that I was literally on the, on the edge. And so what we sometimes think is just a one-off, you know, therapeutic encounter or an encounter with a mental health professional, a lot of times, and this is another thing I need to highlight, is not sufficient enough to make the kind of change and to transform the deeply seated traumatic life experiences that a lot of us have stored inside of us. So whether those traumatic life experiences and trauma means different things to different people um, has to do with something about how you grew up, something about your workplace, something about loss or grief or a violent experience or a kidnapping or a road accident or you know whatever that is to you, as long as it's a stressful life event that your brain hasn't properly gotten the tools to deal with, in a way that doesn't trigger you or interfere with how you get along with your day-to-day -day life, um, it is possible that those things are constantly till date, even if not on a conscious level, are interacting with how you show up in different aspects of your life, especially we women. And so I, I, I moved on from there with that little bit of high I'd gotten from that therapeutic intervention, thinking that I was fine and I could go on. And it was like flash and it went from zero to 100 very quickly. I thought I was doing well, and then I wasn't doing well. And then that afternoon when I had a near suicide attempt, I kept walking back and forth and telling myself, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. I had tears rolling down my eyes. I was breathing heavily. I was sweating, even though there was like the AC on in the room. And it felt like every single thing inside of me and everything that I had had in terms of experiences was trying to overpower you know, um, my sense of willpower. So a lot of people think, oh no, you know, if I just fight it and then it's going to be fine. And I'm like, mm. if you haven't been there before, you would assume that. But I can assure you as somebody who's been on that edge before, it doesn't work that way. And so a lot of times when people maybe make calls to our helpline and they say, oh no, 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 it's not that bad yet. I'm like, hmm, how bad would you like it to be? Before you begin to understand that um, we're in a society, generally speaking, where at the time when you begin to think that you want to look at your mental health, you've already perhaps gone through five, eight, eight to 10 years of incubation of you know, your mental health challenges or issues that are exacerbating or interacting with the components of your mental health. And so that is something that I want to highlight. If you're thinking, do I? you might want to begin to take action with regards to it. Because we do live in a society where, and I like to say this a lot, a lot of what we have largely is unawareness and under awareness more than anything else. A lot of us, even when we work in the space and operate in the space, are still learning a whole lot about mental health, whether it's from the biomedical perspective, whether it's from the psychosocial perspective or from the human rights perspective or from the lived experience perspective, there are different facets of how mental health interacts on an individual level. Even if two individuals have the same mental health conditions, they can present so differently. And then we're learning also on different levels why things like the human rights perspective or psychosocial model are now, you know, um, areas where parts of the world are beginning to shift to because there are things there and there are models there and frameworks there that could potentially help how we begin to create mental health systems that allow people to show up fully when interacting with mental health care and resources. That was pre-diagnosis. Diagnosis was after I had my near suicide attempt and thankfully I had my sister with me. And um, what that did for my sister is that it shook her. She didn't know where to start from, what's going on, what's happening. She was crying. In fact, at some point, I had to be the one consoling her. It was so annoying because I'm trying to ground myself and I'm also trying to tell you, sorry, please don't cry, you know, and all of those things. And it was very hysterical every time I think about it. Now I laugh about it, but it wasn't funny. Um, and so we, we had all of that. Diagnosis was when we started making calls to hospitals that we knew. And they'll be like, okay, our consultant therapist, psychiatrist, their, her days are Wednesdays and Fridays. And I'm like, yo, it's a Saturday. I need 
somewhere to go to as an emergency. So I'm going to tell you honestly that there isn't enough. There is a dearth of adequate emergency mental health care in Nigeria. So when we tell people that you need to address things as soon as possible, what we really are saying is that it's not just about you, is that when you do get the chance to interact with the system, the system is not equipped to interact with everything that is coming with it. And so it is very, very important that, you know, you take that sense of care with yourself as well. Um, we I ended up having to just go to a cousin's house who had served in the in the U.S. military and who had dealt with anxiety and things like that. And so, you know, she, she managed to like, you know, you know, sort of like envelope me with love. But diagnosis also meant that I had to come clean with my family and friends. I needed some level of support. I needed to begin to tell people what was happening to me. And partly because my behavior and emotions at that time was interfering or at least interacting with how I showed up to these spaces. And so it meant who do I tell and who do I not tell? And that is such an important part about when it comes to anything that has to do with mental health conversations. Do you want to go straight and tell social media? Are you ready for the backlash that's going to come? Are you going to tell, are your parents actually trusted people? You know, you have to discern that for yourselves, for your own self, because it's super important that, you know, if I say, oh, my parents were and your parents aren't, it can become a vicious cycle. So it also meant that I had to go see a psychiatrist all over again, tell my parents all the experiences that I felt were very important to my life, and then to also be able to seek their support. But it also meant that they weren't going to understand at first, and not just my parents, but family and friends. I had to do the extra work of helping them understand. This is going to be very important to a point that I'm going to make later. Post-diagnosis is me here. Um, still on um, antidepressants. Um, I was on mood stabilizers for at least um, two years. And um, I'm here to really tell you that it is possible to live with a mental health condition and still live a functional life. However, that is a function of when you do seek support, the kind of support you receive and how holistic the support is. And of course, the individual interactions within yourself. What are the previous traumas or experiences that you've had and how can you begin to sort those out? Throughout the entire journey of pre, um, during diagnosis and post diagnosis, I have, I have highlighted some challenges, some learning, some opportunities as well. But I want to tell you a little bit of what I use those experiences to do and how I'm contributing to helping you and, you know, millions of Nigerians and, you know, even people in the diaspora to continue to maintain stability, especially now in an unstable world. Last year was a bit of a leveling ground uh, of some sort for a lot of people. For many people who had never experienced mental health or mental health, um, you know, issues or had never actually questioned themselves with regards to their mental health, started doing that. We saw many studies that talked about, you know, people presenting with depression last year more than ever. At our own organization, She Writes Woman, we saw our helpline calls spike by 75% with a lot of people calling with regards to um, depression, relationship-related issues, and issues with regards to work. And so COVID-19 did that for us. But one thing that we have done over the last five years at She Writes Woman is that we've been able to create a movement that serves people who actually live who have had lived experience. No, now, whether that lived experience has a label on it or you didn't get a label, but you know that you tend to deal with maybe severe anxiety or things like that, it is a movement for you. And over the last um, you know, five years, we have been able to do a lot. We have a 24 seven toll free helpline, which you can call when you wanna speak confidentially about your issues. You tend to talk to uh, a trained counselor. We have teletherapy as well. And, you know, we have a virtual community, which hopefully we're using technology to leverage and, you know, skill for more Nigerians to receive what we would like to call somewhat of a primary mental health care sort of like platform. But with COVID came a lot of symptoms. For a lot of people, they found more time on their hands, but they found that they were less productive. They realized that there were issues within the relationships or their relational issues within the family system, or whether that is you and your partner or you and your children and the entire family staying in one place. For a lot of people, they realized for the first time, and you can begin to think about it for yourself, that the activities that took them out of the house were actually activities that kept them grounded. They were coping mechanisms to certain kinds of things. And so what they saw over time was that I do have certain kinds of issues that I need to deal with.
And so a lot of people started to look inward, started to question, why am I acting like this? Why am I sleeping so much? Why am I not sleeping enough? Why am I eating so much? Why am I not eating enough? Why am I having bouts of anger and just irritated? Why am I having crying spells and lashing out at people? And so some of the things that I just want to give you as somebody who has an existing uh, mental health condition, but also works very well with um, a large number of people, whether it's in schools, organizations, individuals, and even government parastatals, is that a lot of what affects your mental health is not just about what we think mental health is. Because when I try to water mental health down, I tell people, it's really your thoughts, it's your feelings, and it's your behavior. It's how your thoughts and feelings influence your behavior. And ultimately, your behavior determines how you show up to different aspects of your life. And so when we think about it, about it from that perspective, you begin to realize that there are certain thoughts that are not working for you. There are certain emotions that are not working for you. And to a large extent, a lot of us do not have the tools and the capacity to be able to self-interrogate and have the self-awareness to begin to handle that ourselves. A lot of our predisposition to mental health issues is not just about just mental health. A lot of times it's about sleep. It's about nutrition. It's about social welfare issues, things that have to do with job, um, good employment, housing, which are also systemic issues. And that's why she writes to me, we do a lot of work with advocacy with regards to really calling on government and government related organizations um, to be able to pass laws that are beneficial for people in recognizing mental health as a holistic human rights issue, as a psychosocial issue, not just something where people always have to think about it in terms of drugs and medications, but things that people have to look at in terms of poverty being a huge determinant of how our mental health is. We also look at things that have to do with, like I said, social welfare and social determinants of issues like that. And so it's not enough for us to self-care our way out of an unstable world. We must build systems. We must build a Nigeria where mental health is incorporated into our primary health care, where you can go in for malaria, 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 which is what, which was my case when I was still working in the financial sector, was I was always falling, I was always falling ill with malaria. But then later when I realized that Frequent malaria was also an indication that there might be some emotional issues that are weakening your emotional, your, your, your physical health and your immune system. That mental health is an interaction between all of the types of wellness and health, you know, for us to begin to like present, you know, because it's just so much because I don't want to come here to tell you, oh, meditate in the morning, be mindful, which Dr. Kafai has done amazing with, Dr. Bonjo has already alluded to, but I also want to let you know that there is only so much that is within your power and we have to do a lot in building a system because you wake up in the morning you do your meditation and all of that you get stuck in traffic for four hours you're not going to be happy you can try to dissociate yourself you can have these tools to keep you grounded so that eventually you don't just you're not controlled wholly by your emotions but ultimately they still affect you you are in a system where you know there are gunshots just you know not far away from you how are you going to self-care your way out of that so please and please on the one hand Take all these tools seriously. Take your morning seriously. Take some time to go back into yourself. Take some time to listen into your inner conversations. What? How do you speak to yourself? Like um, Dr. Kafaya has spoken about, wh who controls the voice in your head? Because a lot of times we say it's the voice in our heads, but really it is a combination of conditioning and experiences that have taken us from childhood. A lot of times it's the critical dad. Sometimes is the first boss you had who wasn't particularly very kind to you. And before you know it, you internalize these voices and then these voices become what you think is your voice. And so that voice continues to lead you to certain kinds of outcomes. In order for us to change outcomes on an individual level, we must then begin to look at the experiences, the traumas, the beliefs, the values that we hold that ultimately bring about certain kinds of experiences. And if you do not like where you are at in terms of experiences, or events that are happening to you, then you're gonna to have to backtrack because this is who I am. It's not necessarily the case. You are not a naturally anxious person. I'm not, I naturally do not speak out. Well. I naturally, no, you weren't like that at two years old. It was learned behavior. And so something has to shift, either your internal environment or your external environment has to shift. So thank you so much. I hope that really gives a bit of perspective. Wow, um, I, I feel privileged as I'm sure um, every single person on this call right now does 
um, to have heard from a woman like us a lived experience, an intimate experience, a personal experience, um, a first-hand experience um, of mental health told so candidly and um, so honestly, um, and in a way that, um, particularly for me, um, highlighted um, the gaps in our healthcare system. So as an investor um, in healthcare systems across Africa, trained in medicine and obviously trained in finance, um, I can remember a few years ago bringing up um, an investment in a mental health um, program and everybody started laughing. Everybody said, oh, Nigerians are OK, that these things are for white people. Um, and, you know, hearing this personal experience of some of the failings um, of our healthcare system when it comes to mental health was particularly um, touching. And also um, hearing um, about the stigma um, around mental health and sometimes how, I mean, what really hit me was the fact that you were sharing a bed with somebody but could not discuss it with the person till a certain time um, because of the stigma attached um, to mental health. So thank you so much um, for sharing, Hawa. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people have learned from it. I'm sure that you've given a lot of people the strength and the confidence um, to address some of the issues that they might be facing in their own lives. And um, for people that work in the healthcare system and are supposed to be fixing it, um, you've thrown the gauntlet and re really given us a challenge um, to try and um, improve things with, 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 with um, perhaps a bit more determination than we've been doing before. So thank you so much for that, Howard. We're now going to move on to the Q&A session. Um, some people sent in questions in advance. Um, some people sent um, in questions in the chat box, and I'd welcome the audience um, to continue putting um, comments in the chat box. We have a very short time for Q&A. Um, so if all the um, panelists and all the speakers could put their cameras on, I'll ask a question. If we could give um, a response in 30 seconds to a minute so we can get through as many questions as possible. I'm not going to direct them to particular speakers. Um, there's only um, three. So whoever feels um, the most qualified to answer um, can just chip in um, an answer to a question um, so we can get through as many as possible. Um, because of the personal nature of some of these questions, I won't be saying who the question is from, but I'm sure um, the, the people will know themselves when I read out their questions. Um, so the first question um, comes from a lady who asks, how do you manage a husband who continually tells you you're stupid and good for nothing when this is a man that you've been doing everything for? Do you keep quiet or do you, and accept that you're stupid or do you answer back? Thank you. It's looking like it's just how and I that is here, right? Yes. Okay, Wunju isn't in. Yes. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll take that. And um, incidentally, that's you know part of the things that Hawa was talking about. When you're in the same space as the person who is the you know predisposition and possible the um, precipitator because they would then trigger as well. They would predispose you and then they would then trigger, you know, this bout of, um, you know, your the episodes of either, an, either an anxiety or trauma or, you know, depression. It is, I mean, when it comes to issues like this, you know, the first thing to say is, um, you know, ha, you know, have you checked yourself? Have you done everything that you need to do for this man? Have you dressed yourself well? Are you sure? You know, but then she has said, I've done everything possible. For this person, I'm going to say the first thing is you have to, number one, take care of yourself, not in the sense of taking care of the other person, but for, your, for yourself. Where are you at the moment in terms of your own mental health care? That needs to be, you know, ascertained. What are the things you need to do? Do you need to, you know, seek any form of help? And the moment you're on the right track and you know that you're at the point where you can make, you know, um, enabling decisions, one of the things you can explore is having, you know, marital counseling with this person. One thing that is also important is assertive, you know, assertiveness, ability to, you know, to stand your ground and not allow, um, the other person might not come in for, you know, coming from as for an assessment. I might not even say this is what is wrong with the other person, but you would find that a lot of women are, are in marriages with people who have certain personality, um, disorders and traits that does not even allow them to be able to see reason with this person why they make it, why they have concerns about the way you respond to them or you talk to them. So it's like 
they don't have empathy for what you're talking about. They can't connect to what you're talking about. We always talk about marital counseling or marital therapy. That's another thing to explore. So first things first, you must be sure that even yourself, you haven't you know, become a person who is now living with symptoms of anxiety or depression or even possibly suicidal because of all that you have gone through. If you find that you're not there yet, it means that you should, as long as you know that you have done everything right for this person and you continue to be at this point where they constantly abuse you, because that's what it is. It is emotional abuse when they continue to do all sorts of things. It's a form of abuse. A lot of women don't know it. And it might mean that it's this other person who needs to go and seek help for themselves and not you because society is going to continue to tell you to seek help for yourself. So Absolutely. that is that. And then marital counseling, if you think that you still want to continue, I always say that separation does not necessarily mean that it's the end. It's not an extreme form of um, reaction and it's not catastrophic all the time. It might be the point where two people need to separate and go and reevaluate. Do we still want to do this? Is this person still in, in, important to me? If you cannot value them in your house, perhaps if they are a way, you then value them. So those are the things that I'm going to say to that and I'm going to allow Hawa to respond as well because I'm sure that she would also have had a lot of you know, experience in dealing with people like this. But I have another question for Hawa actually. Oh, and this is oh, um, for somebody that has had um, a suicidal thoughts. Um, and she said that right now in my life, everything seems not to be working. I'm a divorcee. I have three children. I have old parents to care for, but I don't even have a stable job despite my second degree. The pressure is too much and I'm considering suicide. What can I do to be mentally stable considering that my kids need me? I know it's having a negative effect on them. Wow, wow, that's a lot. I mean, first off, thank you so much for um, bringing that here, just being vulnerable and expressing that. I cannot say, you know, I mean, even though I have had suicidal allegations, the truth is that a lot of things that have to do with mental health are very individual in their experiences from person to person. So um, thank you so much. I can't imagine what you're going through. I would tell you that um, when it gets to SOS situations like this, um, we don't particularly get people to, you know, do some sort of self-care to get out of where they are because you're already get out of where they are because you're already out of where they are because you're already out of where they are because you're already out of where they are that you uh, i would just drop in a toll-free helpline here um so that you can call and get emergency support that you need and then you can also go into teletherapy that we also offer uh it's free so that you can also begin to talk through hands-on on the kinds of things that you can do to begin to put your life back to where you hopefully desire it to be uh but i wouldn't speak too much with regards to any form of self-help we don't do self-help at the point of um, suicidal thoughts Okay, um, the next question is, when, what do you do when you're stuck in an environment that constantly poses a threat to your mental health, or you can't leave? I think um, Dr. Abiri, um, if you're there, um, that would be a, a really interesting question to tackle. The person hasn't gone into details about what situation does that put in this box? Said stuck in an environment that constantly poses a threat, but they can't leave. All right, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear. All right. Well, so all right. Well, so uh, being stuck in an environment that is toxic, and I mean, I, I saw the question, and I saw that uh, it spoke to being in a toxic work environment. Um, it's important, of course, to first of all identify that many of our work environments, and indeed uh, the Nigerian environments, many places are actually toxic without us even knowing that these places are toxic. Um, apart from identifying that work environments are toxic, it's important to also identify that the culture in many workplaces is toxic without even people realizing that the culture is toxic. People just, you know, pretty much think about the fact that, well, it's the way that we've always done things for such a long time and would continue to do things this way. Unfortunately, it has impacts not just on the mental health, but the physical health of people who are also in such organizations or in such environments. And so the first thing that I would say is that you need to be self-aware. Self-awareness is power. 
it is key. And, you know, when I was delivering the keynote speech, one of the things that I said was that sometimes we need to identify and avoid people, places, and processes that can be detrimental to our health. Aside identifying this is the fact that we also need to arm ourselves with certain skills that I like to call soft skills. Skills of assertiveness, like Dr. Fire mentioned, of emotional intelligence, skill of resilience, and they can be a they can create a world of difference between someone who goes to work, has to deal with people who are not not supportive at the workplace and comes home feeling exhausted and someone who goes to work and is also able to deal with the seeming politics that also happen at the workplace. Of course, the bigger picture is that the problem may be bigger than you. And so it's to encourage that the culture goes from one that is toxic to one that creates a safe and kind, non-judgmental environment for every person at the workplace or every person, depending on where it is in their lives that they are at. At the end of the day, it's everyone's responsibility. I mean, if all of us, all of the women here, leave this session thinking that all that I want to do is make the world a kinder, safer, better, and more conducive place for others, it would create a ripple effect in each and every one of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you for that great answer. Um, we're coming up to time. Um, we're coming up to time. We're coming up to time. And I know that um, we're supposed to be finishing um, the conference by 12, but I can also see a lot of questions, um, a lot of very intimate questions, a lot of people really going through um, certain situations. So, um, you know, I belong to a business group called YPO, and um, we don't volunteer, we're voluntold. Um, so I'm going to volunteer the panelists. Um, and uh, hopefully they will honor the invitation to perhaps respond to some of these um, via email, maybe two emails each, I'll do my best as well, um, to just respond to some of these questions. And obviously, um, you know, some of the more severe ones, perhaps um, the psychiatrists and psychologists among us um, can also um, be able to offer services because there are a lot of questions. Um, but um, because of time and because, you know, I, I feel it's honorable to always end um, events when we say we're going to end. I know that people have things planned um, after and we said we're going to end at 12 o'clock. I think that um, I need to move to the closing remarks, but please send in your questions. Um, the Flourish Africa team will take those questions and then distribute them amongst the speakers and try and um, get you some answers because I, I'm seeing some really intimate um, issues um, that maybe even have to be dealt with um, sort of in a longer um, type of forum. Um, but there was one question that I did want to answer. Somebody asked, um, before I move to my closing remarks, somebody asked, why are women so damaging to each other and always trying to drag them, um, drag each other down? Um, how do we break this narrative and, and start uplifting ourselves? Um, so I think it's really, really important for women um, to kind of stop telling ourselves this. Um, we're coming up to election season. So we will we'll see what human beings can do to each other. And this is a forum where men, women are not even involved. Um, you know, it's very rare that you see women on the pages of newspapers that one has sent one to try and kill the other, or, you know, women, like women actually, I think are relatively gentle with each other compared to men. Um, I think that when we read, even at, pick up the average Nigerian newspaper, one is saying one is stupid, one is saying that one defrauded the other, one is saying that one, you know, I, I think that, you know, people can be quite cantankerous, um, in, men can be quite cantankerous in their discourse, um, and we're only just coming out of um, an era in Nigeria where really men were killing each other for power, now we're in a more gentle type of politics, um, where, um, well, fingers crossed, um, that doesn't happen anymore. But I can remember a time when it was much, I mean, if you were around in the military, I didn't live here during the military era, but I, I read about it. I mean, the, I, the, the level of violence and the level of, you know, do or do, they called it do or die politics at that time, um, was um, sort of enabled by men and inflicted by men. Every war has been caused by men. Every sort of, the rate of homicide amongst men is very different from women. Um, so, I think that we should try and tell ourselves that we've done a relatively good job. We can do better. We're still on that path. We can support each other more. Um, but I think it's important to pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, we have been quite a supportive community. 
women's groups, particularly for me, um, Flourish Africa, for example, Wimbies, which I also joined, um, um, I'm a member of, um, Women in Medicine, um, Professional Women's um, Association of Nigeria, P1, um, Women in Finance, have been extraordinarily supportive communities. Um, and I think that sometimes when we accuse women um, of not supporting us, I think sometimes we don't really realize that sometimes that they can't. Um, a woman might look like she's influential because she's married an influential man, but that doesn't mean that she's influential. Um, so I think sometimes we should, we, we should be a little less harsh on our women. I think women do do a terrific job of supporting each other. Um, and I think that as we get wealthier, um, and we get to sit on those board of directors, we get to those political positions, we get to those ministerial positions, and we get there in a firm way, not the type that they can just remove you tomorrow, but we get there in a way that we also have the, the standing um, to be able to do things for other women. I think that that will improve. Um, so I think sometimes we can be harsh to other women, but I think, you know, especially in this community and Flourish, um, women have always been very supportive. Uh, Mr. Lakija, Tony Sani, who I reconnected with um, through this forum, the ladies that I'm connecting with now, the ladies in the audience, in fact, somebody has just connected with me from this audience um, via social media again, and we're already having a conversation. Um, I think, you know, we, 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 we tell ourselves um, things that aren't necessarily true. Um, so moving on to our closing remarks, I think I'm just going to summarize what I've learned from the speakers, Dr. Kafaya, Hawa, and Dr. Abiri. Um, we learned that one in four people will suffer a mental illness. That's 25% of the population. In Nigeria, that's 50 million people. So it's not, strong, it's not something strange or weird. More, it's more people than, ha more people in Nigeria will suffer a mental illness than have a bank account. More people in Nigeria will suffer a mental illness than have a car. More people in Nigeria will suffer a mental illness than fly on an airplane domestically. I think that's, you know, a pretty significant number. So it's not strange or weird or something that we should stigmatize. It's actually incredibly common. Um, the second point that was made is it's not something that happens because you're not religious enough or because you're not prayerful enough. And I think a lot of, even sometimes, unfortunately, maybe some of our religious institutions, and I'm glad that you see that, it's Apostle Foloran Shalakija that has convened this conference. Um, so a lot of times we, we feel that it's because we're not being spiritual enough, but um, a very spiritual person, um, a minister has actually convened this conference. So um, to talk about these issues. So um, I think sometimes we, that inner voice that Dr. Kafaya um, was talking about tells us that it's something that we did. It's, it's our fault. It's because we were not praying enough. And, and, and that's not necessarily true either. We looked from fig we looked at figures um, from the Bible, like Jonah, like Job, like Naomi, that also um, had periods where they were um, quite sad. Um, we also looked at some of the um, other myths about mental health, um, like it, it means that you're weak, or it means that you're lazy. Um, and I think Dr. Abiri also spoke about those voices as well, telling you negative things. Um, and how we, we have to take charge of those voices in our head. Um, we spoke about the effect of the economy on mental illness and the fact that where there are high rates of unemployment, then people suffer more uh, mental health issues where you know, the, the um, compulsory confinement and isolation um, that um, COVID-19 brought about um, meant that there were more cases of uh, mental health disorders. And I think both Dr. Abiri and Hawa mentioned that. Um, and I'll finish with the quote from Time magazine um, on um, Naomi Osaka. Um, I think we learned, we've all learned today that it's, it's okay not to be okay. And despite all the cultural expectations thrust upon us by society, in the words of Dr. Kapaya, it's also sometimes okay to choose ourselves. Thank you so much to Apostle Florence Alakija. Thank you so much to our busy career women speakers for um, giving us your time today. Thank you to the Flourish Africa team who back end have been doing all the work, set up the Zoom, all the technical things. And thank you to the wonderful audience for being here and being so vulnerable um, and being so honest with your questions um, and, and sharing with us and making this a truly fulfilling engagement.
Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you.